Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. How are y'all doing tonight? Ed Nygaard, how you doing, buddy? William, Ronnie, Kevin, how are y'all to this evening? We're going to start here in just a few minutes. Um, tonight, uh, I try to do these uh, once uh, in a great while. Um, hey, John. Welcome, welcome. I uh, try to do these uh, uh, Q&As every once in a while. We're going to have an open Q&A. Uh, then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about doing some uh, different things within the Vetric software, VCAR Pro and Aspire and Desktop. Show you some, you know, little tips and tricks and things and uh, some, you know, Possibly, maybe some helpful tips or th things that you might not know about, about your Vetric software and stuff. Uh, possibly, you know, you might know it already. So we're going to go over a few things. And um, <clears throat> uh, throughout the process, I'm going to be taking you guys as, and girls as questions and uh, answer them, doing my best to answer them and stuff. Hello, hello, Disney Twin. Hey, DJ. All right. <clears throat> I hope everybody's having a good evening. Uh, and um, I hope that you'll be able to take something from tonight's class. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, absolutely. If you have a question or if there's something you ever get stuck on, uh, ask and I'll do my best to answer it. And, uh, you know, that answer could be that question and answer could be beneficial to other users within the chat. So uh, definitely uh, hit that up for sure. All right. Uh, I believe that. Uh, hey, Paula from Jersey. Welcome. I knew you'd pop in. You said you would. Um. Let's see here. Uh, we are going to get started right now. All right, let's minimize this. And the first thing I'm gonna take into is uh, the Vetric VCAR Pro. Now, <clears throat> the last couple of classes, the last couple of weeks, I told you that uh, if you have uh, kind of been here the last couple of weeks, I told you that um, CNC nuts, um, had a nice little tip for resizing things, uh, depending on your material, a great little tip called the, the, the box resizing method. And, uh, Peter over there at uh, CNC nuts, uh, did a great job and I couldn't quite remember what it was. The last couple of classes I had mentioned it and I was like, Oh man, I can't remember what that is. Well, I did my homework and I went through and watched the video. I believe it's uh, episode 136 of his videos where he's making a train and he explains uh, the process of resizing things. Hey, Dave. Welcome, Dave Gatton. Um, and uh, I thought it was just slick as all be it. And uh, I really like it because when we're sizing things let's take this project for instance here uh this project is from makecnc.com if you've never been over to makecnc.com absolutely go check them out they've got some very cool 3d puzzles and projects and all and this one is their hella shark uh, it's a helicopter now when you get a file from uh make cnc uh they usually come in like uh, eighth inch, quarter inch, and half inch scale, or they also come in metric if you're working in millimeters and stuff. 
Well, as we all know, uh, especially if we're cutting these projects out of <coughs> plywood and things, we all know that nominal uh, uh, measurements and all, we, we buy quarter inch plywood or three eighths inch or, you know, half inch or three quarter, but that's not the actual size of the material. Just like when we buy, uh, we go out and buy a one by four, uh, it's not one inches by four inches. It's actually three quarters by three and a half. <clears throat> and well, the same thing goes with our thickness of plywood and stuff. And if I were to, uh, let's say that, you know, I'm going to be, you know, using uh, quarter inch plywood on this. And if I come in to uh, one of these parts here where, you know, we have these slots that are getting cut out to where pieces are going to fit into it, this slot has to be wide enough so that um, our material can fit in. Uh, you know, not too wide so it's sloppy, but not too tight that we have to beat the parts together. It's got to be just right. So I'm going to go large screen here and you're going to uh, see me disappear <clears throat> so we can kind of focus on this. But I want you to look at the bottom of the screen. And you may, you guys and girls may not know this, but when you click on an object, uh, it shows you the width and the height of that object down here. Um, and it even shows you the layer that that object is on up in your layers and everything. Uh, and so by clicking on this, I know that this is an eighth of an inch wide, which is what this project was designed for. This particular file was an eighth inch uh, for eighth inch material. But I, I want to use quarter inch material. Um, and I, you know, let's say that I was cutting this out of a piece of, solid wood uh, and I could plane my solid wood down to a quarter of an inch and you know I'm golden uh, and stuff I just need to size this project up to fit that quarter but if I'm going to be using plywood then I need to actually size the slots up to where they're around 730 seconds you know uh, because that's the actual thickness of the plywood uh, and everything. So this method is very cool. It's called the box method. Basically, <clears throat> all of my parts and all my slots and everything in here are an eighth of an inch wide. Now, these parts already have the dog bone fillets in them that are needed for where the router bit, you know, when it's cutting out this part, it gives a place for the router bit to escape. Uh, so that we don't have rounded corners. We have a nice flat here and our four sides so our piece can fit into it. And the first thing is, is these dog bone fillets are set for that eighth inch material. So basically they're a sixteenth of an inch radius here. Well, the first thing I kind of need to go do is in my uh, fillet tool, which uh, by the way is under the edit objects menu, first icon, third row. I need to set that fillet tool for a 16th of an inch. And I actually got to come over to these fillets and you'll see when I move my mouse over that an X pops up. And I actually need to kind of get rid of those fillets. So I got to go through this entire project, all these parts, wherever there's fillets. And you know, I've got to get rid of them. Now I've got to put them back. I got to put them back after I size my material up to the appropriate size, but if I leave them in there when I resize, they're not going to be the right uh, diameter uh, in things. And you know, they're, they're, they're not gonna be the right radius and stuff uh, for the router bit that I'm gonna choose to use. And also I may, you know, not be using an eighth inch bit to cut this out. I might be using a quarter inch bit, but a quarter inch bit wouldn't fit in here. But, you, you know, I want to make sure that my fillets are the radius of the diameter of the bit that I'm going to be using and stuff and all. And so I want to go through, you know, this project and I'm not going to size all these. I, I just want you to get the idea. You know, we want to come in and we want to get rid of all of these, you know, uh, round dog bone fillets and things. 
not just on the outside corners uh, and stuff, but also on these inside corners as well. And when you put your mouse over a sharp corner, you'll get a check mark, meaning you can put a, you know, a fillet there. And that's a regular fillet. Let's put a dog bone fillet in there like one was in there. You know, it'll put that fillet. But if you also put your mouse over a fillet, there's an X that'll pop up and that'll get rid of it and bring it back to the sharp corner. So we would literally have to go through this entire project, all the pieces and stuff and size it down. But that's, that's, you know, now that you know that I don't need to harp on that. What my goal is, or what our goal is, is um, let's get rid of these fillets here and I'll focus on this particular slot. Let's close this tool now. But if I select this slot, we can see that it's an eighth of an inch wide. And I need to go, I need to size this up so it's 730 seconds. And I love this trick. So the first thing, there's three rules to the box method. Number one, we have to draw a box around our parts that we're going to be resizing. Okay. Number two, at least one of these sides, either the, you know, the vertical or the horizontal, needs to be in direct relation to the slot that I'm trying to resize. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is that slot is an eighth of an inch. <clears throat> and let's, um, we'll be talking about that poem here in a minute, but let's use this notepad for a second. Uh, here, let's create a new blank notepad for a moment. We'll minimize that one down for later. What I mean by that when I say direct relation is our slot is an eighth of an inch wide. My box size needs to either be in relation to this. If I move this decimal point over two spots, 12.5 would be a direct relation, 12 and a half inches, 125 inches, would be a direct relation. 1,250 inches would be a direct relation on and on and on and on. Okay. So um, knowing this on these three sides here, if we look at the box that I've drawn, if we minimize this, this box that I've drawn that'll surround all these parts because these parts are actually pretty good size. Well, my box is already 46 and a half inches long, right? So I can't go to 12 and a half inches because that will size things down. Uh, so I need to go up. So my next size here to go up is 125 inches. So I want to select my, um, I want to select my box and all my parts, make sure they're all selected. I'm going to go into the size tool. And then I'm going to type in my width here and make it 125 inches and I'm gonna click apply. That's gonna size up all of these pieces. Now, if I come over and look at the slot and I click on that, if we look down, <clears throat> um, oh, I'm an idiot, hold on. The, I haven't sized my parts yet. All right, <laughs> all right, so undo that. Let's let's start that over again. Let's draw the box here. My box relationship needs to be 125 inches. Sorry about that, guys and girls. All right. So now I've got my box. Now my box happens to be, you know, just it doesn't matter what size you draw. It just has to surround all your materials. All right. <clears throat> now. I want to select all my materials and go into the size tool. Now I need to size up this in relationship to the size I'm trying to go to. And in my case, I'm trying to size up for my quarter inch plywood, which is 730 seconds. Now I'm gonna do it two ways, uh, both ways. I'm gonna show you if I was using hardwood and, I was, and I, my material was actually a true quarter of an inch, 0.25, then I would change this to 250. Imagine taking that 0.25 and moving the decimal place over twice. And I'll go ahead and click that and it'll size it up. <clears throat> and if we come over here and if I click on one of my parts, you can see 
that that slot is now a quarter of an inch wide, right? But I'm using plywood and I've got to size it to that 730 seconds. So I just undid it and brought it back to where it was. And I'm going to select this and go into my size tool. And so 730 seconds, if I come in here and type in the fraction, 730 seconds, I hit equals, it's going to tell me what my decimal point is, right? And 730 seconds is 0.21875. Well, my box is already 125 inches. So if I roll this decimal point over to the nearest size that I can go up, which would be 218 inches, 0.75, right? So if I retype that, 218.75, and I size this up, if I come into my slots here and we click on that, you will see that I'm at 0.2188. Now, it's not going to show the 0.21875. It's going to round up those last two to the nearest decimal, 218, uh, you know, 0.2188 instead of 0.21875, because uh, it only goes, um, you know, four decimals, but it has sized it up to what I need. And it's sized all the parts now that I can cut them all out of my 730 seconds inch plywood and everything's going to fit together nice and good and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm great. Um, same thing is, let's say that I needed to size this up to half inch material. Let's say I wanted to cut it out of half inch material. Same thing. If I come over here and select my box and everything in it, go to my size tool, 0.5, right? 0.5 is a half inch. If I roll that decimal point over a few times, my nearest size up from the 125 inches that my box is already at is 500 inches. So 500, right? I'll even put this 0.00 in there so you can kind of understand what I mean. If I roll that decimal point back over to the half inch, half inch is a direct relation five inches, 50 inches, 500 inches, 5,000 inches, all of those are in direct relation to my half inch. And so if I scale that up and then I come over here to my parts <clears throat> and I click on my vector, you can see down here that it sized my slot up to a half inch wide. Pretty cool, right? That's the box method. So once again, I'm going to undo all of this and I'm going to come back to my normal size here where I was originally and my eighth of an inch. And once again, from scratch, we're going to do it. I'm going to grab a box. I'm going to draw a box around this. It doesn't matter what size it is uh, at this point. Just draw it to surround all of your parts that you need to resize and then look at that size and make sure that the box size, one of the box sides, is in direct relationship to the current slot size, that eighth of an inch. So in this case, 12 and a half inches isn't going to cut it because I'm already at 37 and a half inches on my box. So I got to go up to the next one, which is 125. Okay. So that creates my box for me. Now select everything and now I need a direct relationship to the size that I'm trying to go up to. And in my case, <clears throat> let's say that we wanted the half inch plywood and our half inch plywood is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it is 1130 seconds. Is it, is it, is it, uh, let's see here. Uh, half inch, 1530 seconds. So I need to size it up to 1530 seconds if I want to use half inch material on these parts. So I've got everything selected. I'm going to come in here. I'm just going to get my 15 because I don't know the decimal. I'm going to go 1530 seconds and hit my equal sign so I can see what it is. And for me, 46.8 is too small because my box is already 125 inches long. 
So I need to go to the next one, which would be 468.75. All right. So 468.75. Click apply. It's going to scale everything up. And if I select on my slot here, I'm at my 0.46875. And again, it rounds it up to 0.8, but that's fine uh, and everything. So a very cool method, flawless, uh, works like a champ. And uh, I really like that. Thanks to Peter uh, for sharing that tip. Uh, again, that was episode 136 on uh, CNC Nuts, uh, CNC Nuts on YouTube. Um, very cool tip, uh, and it's great for sizing up parts when you have fitted pieces that fit together, and you need to make sure those slots are the right size for the material that you're using, and you bring a file in, and it's already kind of designed for a certain size. The box method is a great way to quickly and easily size up the parts. Now, there is a second method that you can use, which requires a calculator. I think this by far, this tip here is one of the absolute easiest ways of doing it. But we can absolutely size up these parts uh, doing a calculation. And if I open up a calculator, <clears throat> I can do the math. Basically, I can take the uh, size that I am going to be sizing to, and we'll just kind of do round numbers. Let's imagine that I'm trying to take the slot up to a quarter of an inch, right? Uh, I can take my 0.125 and divide it by the quarter of an inch, and that's going to give me, you know, uh, basically, it's half the size. And um, the so what I need to do is kind of multiply that by two. Let's do it backwards. Let's do 0.125 divided by 0.25 equals, okay, either way. 0.25 divided by 0.125 equals 2. There we go. We'll use that one. All right. The size that we need to go up to divided by the size that it is gives us 2, which is basically 200% of what it's at. So if I go into and I select all my parts, I can open up the size tool. And in the percentage box, I could type in 200%, scale everything up. And if I come in here and select on my piece, you will see down here that it sized it up to that quarter of an inch. When we get into the fractions and stuff like that, you know, if I was doing the 730 seconds, you know, in that calculation with the calculator, and I keep closing my calculator, I don't know why. Then we start getting into decimal points with numbers that roll over. So let's say on my you know, 730 seconds here, which is 7 divided by 32, 0.21875, right? If I take the size that I'm trying to size up to, which is this, and I divide that by my size that my piece is, 0.125, that's going to give me my 1.75 inches. So basically 175%, okay? So in that part, let's minimize this. If I select my pieces and I come over here and change it to 175%, click apply, select on one of my slots, I'm at my 0.21875 or 2188. It, it rounds it up. And, um, and uh, you know, either one works. But now if you have something with a lot of decimals where it's like 1.6666666, you know, you want to make sure that you type in all those 666, at least enough of them, at least five of them to size it up accurately. Uh, the calculator method can get a little convoluted. The box method is like a champ 
I love that tip. Uh, all right. So that's kind of tip number one. Let's go ahead and start answering some questions. Uh, we got a question from Jeff. Uh, so how much bigger did whatever it is you are building go to by sizing the slots to half an inch? Well, uh, based on the material, like on this helicopter, <clears throat> give you an example, uh, in the eighth inch scale, this helicopter is probably about, I would say, 16 inches in length when it's all put together. Uh, in its half inch scale, uh, the helicopter would probably be about three foot in length. Um, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's a big, you know, when we're using thicker material, it scales the project up to the appropriate size. And so if I took uh, with your question here, how, how much bigger did it make the part? Let's take an example here. Let's get rid of uh, Jeff's question and let me draw my box. <clears throat> First of all, let me figure out what my slot current slot size is. All right. Okay, this is eighth inch scale. And let's uh, take an example here. The... <clears throat> This part here, which is uh, the what? What is that? The the um, cabin of the helicopter, right? This current part right now, the just the cabin part is um, about five inches in length, and then the tail end, which is the wings and the tail end uh, where the guns and all that stuff go, uh, all the way to the tail that slides on there. Let's see, that's about six inches. So right now we're at, let's say 11 inches plus an additional three. So about 14 inches in length is this helicopter when it's all put together, right? So let's go ahead and size it up to half inch slots. We'll go ahead and draw a box. We'll change that box size, uh, at least one of them to 125 inches and click apply. And we're going to select all of our parts in our box, size it up. And in this case, I want to go to 500 inches relationship to that 0.5. Size it up. My slots are at a half an inch. Now, if we kind of take a measurement, uh, my cabin is about 23 inches. My tail stock is 24 inches so we're about 48 inches in length now plus another 15 so about 55 inches in length and it's massive it's 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 a it's huge it's amazing uh i love these uh, projects and a full scale helicopter at a half inch uh, piece i'd probably only go maybe quarter inch or three eighths with it because that's big enough uh when it gets up to uh that length and all it's it's full size model uh, it's huge and uh, fun, but takes up a heck of a lot of room in the in the house or wherever. But uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. And so when you size up your slots, uh, especially on a project, a fitted puzzle like this from uh, MakeCNC.com, uh, when you size them up, it's going to scale the project based on the material. And the files that they give you, if we were to look at the uh, files here, let's right click and <clears throat> open file location. Uh, this comes in uh, a eighth inch scale, quarter inch scale, and a half inch scale. And to give you the direct relationship to the files, let's move this off to the side here. This is my eighth inch scale. If I were to import my quarter inch scale files, zoom way out here. Bear with me while it moves the parts. <clears throat> They're big, so it's going to take a second. I should have zoomed into them instead of tried to drag them from that small. But catch up to me, Vetrick, so I can keep up with my class now. Oh, 
Oh, am I going to crash the Vectric? Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Let's go ahead and open a second one because I believe <coughs> I just crashed that one. All right, let's go in here and <coughs> set this job up again. And let's import my eighth inch scale first. <clears throat> and this time, I'm just going to hit F9 to move it over to the center of my work area. Let's go ahead and move that over here for a moment. Let's import my quarter inch scale. Let's move that over to the center. I'm hitting F9. So you can see my quarter inch scale parts compared to my eighth inch scale parts. And then lastly, let's bring in the half inch scale, the monster. And I will just, it's going to let me drag. I don't know if it'll let me drag. <laughs> I shouldn't have drug it. Oh, did I crash it again? I'm so terrible about that. Um, yeah, faster if you hit center on project. I know, Aaron, I know. And of course, I'm an idiot. I didn't do that. <clears throat> it's much faster. Right now, it's trying to move 100,000 inches over to here. Uh, and uh, I knew better. I knew better the first time I crashed it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got a frog in my throat. There we go. It's catching up. All right. And so let's take these parts and move them over there. And you can see the relationship to the different scales. Eighth inch scale, quarter inch scale, and half inch scale. And... Uh, <clears throat> It's a, it's a massive helicopter when you cut it out of half inch material. It's awesome. Makecnc.com. If you haven't checked them out, definitely check them out. They got all kinds of cool projects, 3D puzzle type projects, uh, houses and trains and uh, planes and all kinds of things. Uh, definitely give them a look. But remember that box method. It will help you in the future when you have slotted parts fitted together that need to fit together. Even if your parts, you know, if you create a project where uh, pieces are going to slot together and you need to scale that up or down based on the material that you're going to carve it, you can use the box method. And uh, again, three rules. Your box has to surround all of the parts that you're going to be sizing. One of the sides, preferably the length, if your slots, um, you know, preferably your length or it could be here as well, your height but at least one of the sides have to be in direct relationship to the current size of the slots. And then when you select everything, your new size that you're going to size to has to be in direct relation to the size you're going to be up to. So half inch would be five inches. If we move the decimal place over once 50 inches, if we move it over twice, 500 inches, if we move it over three times, 5,000 inches on and on and on and on. OK, so uh, and uh, it will never do you wrong. It's awesome. OK. All right. So that was the first tip. Hopefully you like that one. Hopefully that you might get some use out of that one. I know I will. Uh, it's going to be uh, awesome, uh, you know, to use. And as soon as I saw that episode uh, on CNC Nuts and when he did that, uh, I always knew the calculation method. And uh, sometimes, you know, if I didn't put enough decimal points in, you know, uh, based on the calculation, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't hit that size exactly. And, uh, but with this, it, it's perfect. It's great. Love it. All right. So that's tip number one. Let me know what you guys thought about that. All right. Let's get back over to here and um, let's close out of this metric since we have another one open here. And uh, you guys and girls, now while I'm talking and stuff, 
Um, the uh, this is the time for you you all to uh, type in questions. This is an open Q and A on everything. Now, one of the things that I wanted to uh, share with you or talk to you about uh, that you may or might not know about your Vetric software. Did you know? Uh, and if you didn't. Uh, you're going to now, but when you log in to your Vetric VNCO account, uh, where your software is stored and everything, that on your homepage, there's an absolute treasure, treasure chest of projects, free projects from partner projects, different uh, CNC machine companies that partner with Vetric. They've made some projects when they provided files and stuff to share. The project of the month gallery is uh, phenomenal. Uh, this gallery goes back, I don't know how far, um, but it goes back quite a ways. And um, let me uh, sign in again. And there are some amazing free projects, files, and everything in that just go back pages and pages and pages uh, it, within uh, the um, Project of the Month Gallery. On your home page, you have a wonderful little, uh, let's back up one more page, Vetric, back up one more page. <clears throat> you have a, let them load. The In the Labs with Becky and the gang, uh, they make some very cool projects uh, and um, walk you through step by step on some cool projects. There's some great ones in there. There's some nice tips and trick uh, videos, uh, short to the point uh, tips and tricks on, um, you know, different little things and working with inlays or, you know, making terrain maps and stuff and um, using the new mirror mode within uh, the um, modeling uh, tools of uh, Vetric VCarve or Aspire, uh, making print blocks, you know, like of your stamps and stuff like that. But there's all kinds of pages and pages of uh, tips and trick videos and, and things uh, that are amazing. And they're all sitting right there for the taking in your home page of your account when you log in to your Vetric VNCO account, right on that homepage is this wonderful gallery of free projects uh, for you to play with, experiment, have fun with Carve. And there's some very cool projects in there. So uh, I wanted to share that with you. Now, um, <clears throat> hey, Rick Nolan, how are you doing? And Jerry Williams, welcome. Now, one of the... Uh, things, another tip and stuff that I wanted to uh, talk to you about is um, within the software is this hidden gem right here, the distort tool. And I've shown the distort tool a few times uh, with projects and things like that, but it's one of those hidden treasures that uh, just do some amazing things. Uh, let's say just on the simple note, um, We'll type in some text here, and it could be an object, or it could be text. It could be whatever you want it to be, but um, I'm just going to make this a true type font instead of a single line font. Give it a little bit of boldness, and uh, let's uh, <clears throat> crank that out. Now, the distort tool for me uh, basically gives me the opportunity to get away from the everyday uh, cookie cutter type text and stuff when I'm laying out some kind of creative signs and all. Now in this particular font here, I got some overlapping little letters and stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and break that up real quick and do a convert to curves. And I'm gonna take my scissor tool and I'm gonna come in here and trim away those overlaps and get rid of them. All right. Now, I want to distort this text, and the distort tool gives me the opportunity to distort within a bounding box, above a single curve, or between two curves. 
Now the bounding box basically is like sticking your object, whatever it may be in an envelope. And however you stretch that envelope, however you twist and curve that envelope, the text and everything is going to follow along with it, you know? So what it does for us is it really just kind of uh, gives us the opportunity to, you know, if I'm laying out a sign and I just want, you know, certain parts of it to kind of just like pop and everything, uh, then, you know, I can come in and distort, uh, you know, however I, you know, want, uh, whatever I do to this box, uh, I can take these straight lines and I can turn them into arcs. I can turn them into busy curves to where, you know, I'm kind of flexing. I can, you know, do all kinds of things with these objects and stuff and really start to get some, uh, creative, a uh, little flow there with my text and stuff. Now, when you're in the distort tool uh, in the object, it's still in that envelope. So, you know, if I needed to edit, let's say I wanted to edit the H on the hooray. If I try to go into node editing mode, you'll notice that it's still inside that box and I can't, I can't select the H. It's only going to let me edit this, you know, what's outside of the box. I've got to convert it to curves again. So if I right click on the object, Let's get out of uh, the distort mode there. Uh, I got to right click on the object and convert to curves. And that will take the object out of the distortion. And now I can come in and if I need to edit some nodes or whatever, I can, you know, uh, do that, you know. Uh, so you just got to remember to uh, convert it to curves. Uh, after you distort it to break it out of that envelope or take it out of that envelope, if you will. All right. So be sure to, uh, you know, check out that distort tool. It's pretty cool. Now, when you do distort an object, uh, it no longer is a font, especially if it's a font. Now, uh, you, it's no longer a font. So make sure you got your spelling correct and the font that you want to use because there's no going back and editing it or changing it and stuff. You just have to kind of delete it and start over again if you want to change fonts and all. But it's still a fun, creative tool that doesn't get a whole lot of use uh, and, and uh, a whole lot of attention. And it deserves a lot of attention. It's a pretty cool tool for breaking out of the monotony of just, you know, arcing some text or, you know, running a little curve or this, or that. You can really kind of have some fun with it and stuff and really make a statement with your projects and all. Um, so yeah. Um, now how many of us, um, ever make, uh, cribbage boards or, or things like that? Um, typically with cribbage boards and stuff, typically we have our raceway. Uh, it could, we could have, uh, you know, where our little pegs go and it could be two circles. It could be three circles. You could have, you know, where three players are racing around two players or what have you. I usually work with three players and <clears throat> one of my, uh, uh, favorite little tricks is, is my holes, those little holes and all they're an eighth of an inch wide. Cause that's how, or in diameter, that's how, uh, big the, uh, pin is that I use. Those are the holes that are going to get drilled. Well, what I typically do is draw a rectangle that is an eighth inch wide by one inch in length. And I take my eighth inch circle and I put it in transform mode by double clicking on it. And if I hold my control key down, I can drag down two more copies. And if I take my two, my three circles here, excuse me for a minute. I don't know why I have something in my throat today, but if I take my three circles and select them first, and if I hold my shift key down and select that rectangle last, I can come in and use my alignment tool to align them to the center of that rectangle. And then I can space them equal distance within that rectangle. OK, and um, I also like to come in and draw a line. Let's see if I can zoom in here. 
I like to kind of snap to the center and draw a line down the center. Space bar. Now, within this group, I'm going to uh, select these objects, these three objects here, and I'm going to group them together as one. And then I'll have just my rectangle and my line, you know, uh, separate. And now I can take this object here and this trail or path, whatever it may be, it could be a heck of racetrack of things for all I certain, but I'll just, you know, here, um, I need to, I'm going to have this object here, follow this path. And I think, uh, you know, 120 circles is, you know, kind of how many player holes there are. I usually go 140. That, that way I can delete some and give me some space for my start and finish lines. But if we use our copy along vector tool and we take our object here and hold down our shift key and, you know, select our track and it's basically select the object that you're going to copy followed by one or more vectors to create that copy along. Right. So I select my object first and then my track last. It's always what you select last. And in this case, I'll 140 uh, of those objects. I'm going to, I want to align uh, the object curves. I want to create them on a new layer and copy that around. And of course, let's uh, stop that because I love how I did that. Let's select our object here. And now that I've got the circles grouped, I'm going to take the whole thing and group it together. So it's treated as one. Sorry, I missed that step. And now that I have that object, I can go ahead and select my trail there. And once again, copy that around. And what that's going to do is it's going to give me the exact number that I want with the correct spacing and everything that I need. And now I can go through and uh, let's say that um, I delete these first five here. This will be kind of my start line. This will be my finish line over here. And then from my starting line, I'm going to uh, ungroup. And the letter U on your keyboard is ungroup. So I can ungroup that and I can select my rectangle and delete it, my circles and delete it. That's going to give me my divider line from my start point. And then every five, one, two, three, four, five, on that sixth one, I'm going to do the same thing. Ungroup it. Single click on the line to turn it off and hit delete. And we're going to separate our groups all the way out. And it's a nice way. This is just a nice way to get that nice equal spacing all the way around this little tip right here. Okay. And uh, then you can go around and just start kind of laying out your cribbage board, game board, whatever the case may be. So just a fun and quick and easy way to lay out uh, cribbage boards and game boards and stuff. And it works with, you know, other objects too, marble games and things like that. All right. Everybody's quiet tonight. Y'all just listening to me talk. I'm gonna, what if I, I'm going to hush for a minute, let y'all type some questions in. Um, the, uh, Circular Array tool uh, is one of my favorite tools um, for creating things like clock uh, hands and laying out clock parts, but also um, for laying out parts with uh, models and things. And so we're going to switch out of Vetra because I want to kind of switch this up a little bit. And we're going to go into uh, Spire. And I'm going to be, as I'm talking with you guys, I'm going to be creating a model. We're going to create a uh, rose compass model within the Aspire. Uh, but also, I'm going to talk to you about some of the things you may not know about your modeling tools when it comes to profiles and two rail sweeps and things. And I'm just going to keep talking and rambling and showing you these little tips and tricks and things until somebody else. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and let's go uh, 12 inches by 12 inches by uh, three quarters of an inch thick. And we'll set that up. 
First thing I'm going to do is on my compass rose, I need a four point star. Now, on my four point stars, I like to come down uh, on the internal radius to around 35 to 30 to 35. And so <clears throat> if I come in here, you can see that the 35 has kind of a, you know, a bit of width to it. Let's look at this at a 30 and click apply. You know, when we get skinnier, let's look at it as a 25 and apply so on and so forth until you get, you know, that shape and that size that you want. Right. And this is going to be our north, south, east and west, our starting point for our object. So the first thing I'm going to do is center this up on the material. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and let's size it up just a little bit more. Hold my control key down and size, or not my control, my shift key down and size it up just a little bit more. And now I'm going to hold my shift and control key and I'm going to size down to probably right about here. Let's go right about here. And on that object, if I hit the number nine key, so control and shift kept the object centered and sized it and made a copy, uh, keeping it centered of the original object. And now my number nine key is a counterclockwise rotation. So I can as many times as I tap it on, I just want to tap it once. I want to, and it rotates 45 degree increments. So uh, there we go. <clears throat> right. And, um, uh, so this will be the uh, start of the uh, compass and everything. Now, at 45, I may also want a little point at, uh, you know, 22 and a half degrees, right? So if I take my object here and, again, holding my shift and control key, we'll size this down a little bit. Actually, we'll size this one up a little bit. Let me think here. Which one do I want to do? We'll size this just about that size there. Now, on this one, again, if I hit my number nine key, it's going to move in 45 degree increments. And I want to kind of rotate, you know, 22 and a half. So I'm actually going to use the rotate tool. And um, I'm going to rotate this based on the center of that object or the center of my material, however you want to look at it, relative. And I'm going to go 22.5 degrees and, uh, you know, start getting that, um, that, that compass rose laid out. And let's... Let's get this. That'll be my small one. Let's make that one a little bit bigger. Let's take this one, my 45, and let's make that one a little bit bigger. Okay. And when I, you know, as I come in here and stuff, I'm going to be working with each of these vectors kind of one at a time and everything. Uh, let's start with our big one. And in the, you know, uh, Vectric software, I have the ability to create shapes or, you know, do two rail sweeps, one rail sweeps and things um, uh, within the Aspire and all. And I'm going to use just the regular create shape tool and I'm going to use my pointed profile, my angled profile, angular profile, if you will, the proper term. And in this case, I want a 45 degree angle. I want it to come to a nice, you know, point and everything. And on here, depending on, you know, how tall I want my model to be and stuff, I'm probably going to not give this a base height. I'm probably going to uh, uh, just have it at zero. And when I click apply, let's split view here. So you can see, you know, that's going to kind of give me this uh, initial 
shape here and all. Now, on this piece, I don't want it to come to a point here. I want it to kind of flatten out because I'm going to put a round dial, if you will, kind of a round dial here in the middle. So when I size this and stuff, it's going to take that angle basically, and it's going to size it up to the height to where I get that 45 degree angle. So I have it at no limit, meaning it's going to go up to its maximum height that it needs to, to create that 45 degree angle. But in this case, I'm going to limit the height. I want it to kind of flatten off at a certain point. Now, right now I had an eighth of an inch in there and you can see as it come up at an eighth of an inch, it kind of flattens out. Well, I don't want it that flat. So I'm going to limit it probably, um, let's go no limit again and let's look exactly what our height is. If I put my mouse over here, I'm roughly about 1.1946 inches in, on my Z, if you look down at the bottom of these numbers here. And so I'll probably limit this, uh, limit this height probably about to a half an inch. So let's change that to 0.5 and click apply and go up to that half inch and then it'll kind of flatten out. And I'm okay with that for right now. Okay. So I'm going to start a new component and uh, I'm going to take my next object here. Now on this object, I'm going to do the same thing, uh, but this time I'm going to merge the two together. If I don't merge, if I go ahead and create this shape, I want you to watch what happens when you add for that combine mode. When you add, it's like taking a sheet and draping it over a car. It's going to take on, that sheet's going to take on the shape of the car underneath it. Well, if I add one model on top of another, it's going to drape that top model over the other, you know, just like draping that sheet over that car. And that's not what I want. I want these to merge together. So if I merge, then it will merge those parts together, creating this shape here. Okay. And then finally, we'll create another component. And on my 45 degree angle, again, I'm going to keep things uh, consistent. Uh, and again, I'm going to merge and I'm just going to apply. Build that up. Okay. So now I've got my kind of compass rows. Now my compass rows is missing. I've got 22 and a half, 45. I'm missing my point here. I'm missing my point here. I'm missing my point here and I'm missing my point here, right? So I've got to take my 22 and a half degree. Oops. First of all, let's get back there to that 45. Click apply. Put that back. Always click on start a new component when you're about to another vector. Start a new component. All right. So now I'm going to take my <coughs> object here. Once again, uh, I'm going to uh, make a copy of this, leaving it the same size and everything. So I'm just going to, uh, I have two choices. I can right click and go copy, paste, and I'll have that pasted copy there that I can, you know, rotate uh, 45 degrees to get my other 22 and a half. Uh, or I could have just free ro hand rotated it. I could have, you know, done one heavy. So I decided to copy and paste and then it selected the new pasted, uh, you know, vector. And then I was just able to rotate it that 45 degrees to get where I need. And now that I have it selected in my tool, I'm just going to merge, click apply, and finish off my compass rows there. Okay. So this particular compass rose is going to have a lot of points, my 22 degree and 45 degree increments and everything. And now I want to create my center medallion, if you will. And let's, before we create the center medallion, let's pause for the cause and let's answer a question. Uh, William Edlin uh, asks, uh, currently have Vetric 9.5 and TNG on computer A, and I want to move to a new faster computer B. 
I also want to upgrade to Vetric 10. So do I upgrade to Vetric 10, then try to migrate from computer A and B? Um, probably the best way to go with that, William, would be to just go ahead and do your Vetric 10 upgrade on the current computer that you're at. Um, unless you don't want, uh, vet, unless you're kind of kind of toss that computer or if it's just going to be a backup and all, then um, because you've got to go log into your account anyway and download the 9.5, you know, uh, on your new computer. Well, what you should do is you should do your Vetra VCARB 10 upgrade first, because when you go into your account and you purchase the upgrade, uh, and if it's a purchased one, if it's free, then it's there already. But if it's a purchased one, they're going to put that 10 in your account. That way, all you have to do is power up the new computer, log in, get online and log into your account and download version 10 to the new computer. It does not need 9.5 on it. That would be kind of a waste of space. So do your Vetric VCARB 10 upgrade first. You do not have to download it to your old computer. You just open up your new computer, log into your account and download version 10 to your new computer. Uh, as far as the... TNG software, the Planet CNC TNG controller software that you use, uh, you will just uh, carry those files and your setting files from computer A over to computer B and you'll be all set. Awesome. <clears throat> Sherry Fuller joined the session late. Tardy. I'm giving you a tardy slip. Sherry says, I joined the session late. Not at this question. Uh, not sure if this question is for tonight. I want to duplicate a drawer front profile, a beadboard inset into a frame. Any way to create custom beadboard panels? Absolutely. So um, there are a few ways that we can create a custom beadboard panel. Uh, let's. I'll just pop back into VCarb 10 for this. Um, cause it does not require, um, it does not require Aspire or modeling or anything to do that. Let's, uh, go into our job size and let's say that our cabinet door is, uh, 12 inches wide by 24 inches tall by three quarters of an inch thick. This is just an example sure. Um, <clears throat> We would come in and I'm going to draw a rectangle, uh, the size of my actual panel. And then I'm going to offset that rectangle inward. I'm going to inward, uh, I'll probably go about an inch and a half uh, to make it look like that, uh, that framing, you know, that panel door framing and stuff. So I'll probably go about an inch and a half, sometimes even two inches, but an inch and a half should be good. Uh, I want to delete the original rectangle that I drew and select the new. And that's going to give me my offset uh, panel in there and um, measure the frames of your old cabinet. See how wide the actual frame is around the faux B board. And um, then, uh, you know, make your offset accordingly to that. Now on uh, my faux B board panel, I'd like to have uh, some nice decorative internal radius corners. So I'm going to go with a one inch internal radius corner. And uh, that's going to give me kind of my raised panel door. Now I'm going to take and I'm going to draw a line right down the center of my panel. And then uh, from there, I'm going to offset that line. Um, we'll start inward. And um, let's go. Let's go. Um, three eighths of an inch. Uh, part. Let's see what that is. No, that's too too narrow. We need to go one inch. All right, that'll work. We'll go one inch in this direction. Select that center again, and we'll go outward this time and go one inch in that direction. All right, I don't need this line. Boom. On these lines here, I can simply uh, come in and select those uh, first. Hold down my shift key, select this last, 
and use my regular trim tool to clear outside of that boundary and that will get rid of those overlapping lines. And now I can come over and create my toolpath. Believe it or not, this toolpath will be done with two bits, an end mill and a 90 degree V bit. So our first toolpath is going to be a, uh, we can do a V carve toolpath or a profile cut with a V bit. I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna go down, uh, let's see here, I wanna go, I'm going to take, I'm going to skim some off the top, probably about three thirty seconds. Let's see here. Let's go a quarter of an inch. A quarter of an inch. Uh, let's go um, with a 90 degree V bit. And I want on this one, I'm going to go on the inside of the line. So that bit is uh, cutting on the inside of the line here. I think, am I going to go inside of the line? Let's go on the line. We'll go on the line. Mm, let me think. Yeah, on the line. We're going to go on the line. Uh, let's calculate that out. Okay, that's going to create that... Uh, uh, that profile there and um, on these uh, vectors here also going to uh, be a profile toolpath. I could have probably put both of them together uh, and everything, uh, but I'll create a second one. Same depth, uh, same bit, same on the line. Uh, we'll calculate that and uh, that will create the uh, beads. Okay, now we're going to do a pocket toolpath. This is where the magic comes in. On this profile here, we're going to do a pocket toolpath with our quarter inch end mill. Uh, and in this case, we're going to mill this down a bit. Let's see here. Let's, let's mill it down. I'm going to go an eighth of an inch for right now. I'll, if I find, I actually have numbers for a faux B board panel. Uh, I'll give you the numbers if I can find it. Uh, quarter inch end mill. Let's go an eighth of an inch. Um, we're going to raster 90 degrees with the grain. And uh, we're going to do the profile pass first. Okay, so it'll go and do the profile pass first. So let's select our outside border and calculate that. And um, we're going to, uh, let's preview that tool path. And a quarter of an inch, my beads are a little too deep. I want shallower beads uh, on this. Um, so, we'll probably go back to our profile toolpath and shallow those up a little bit. Um, probably about three thirty seconds is what we're going to mill off there and everything, but that would create our faux beadboard panel. And uh, you know, you would look at your design and, and see how deep you want the beads to be. Uh, you know, and stuff if you don't want them really shallow or deep and all, but it kind of gives it that nice recessed panel look. And um, that's how I would go about creating a faux beadboard panel, Sherry Fuller. Okay. Good question. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, we'll, um, Sherry, let me know if that, I know you sent me a picture, but let me know if that, uh, helps you out uh and um then we'll address the uh image you know one-on-one -on -one. i can work with you and stuff and all but uh this is kind of the basic approach of creating that faux b-board panel all right uh let's go back and then we'll get back to our compass rows uh williams says continued or install my vetric 9.5 or new v10 on computer b if i install the new on computer b what file 
and settings do I bring over from computer A? So uh, the two files that you want to bring over from computer A uh, with regards to your Vetric software, um, you want to go to your file open application data folder. <clears throat> And uh, in that data folder, you want to go into my post P and you want to bring over your post processor files uh, that are in there. Uh, these are your digital wood carver custom post processor files, William. Uh, you want to bring, you want to copy those over. And uh, if you don't want to copy from computer A to computer B, you can download those off of the digitalwoodcarver.com website uh, under the support and downloads page. You can just re download them and all. Uh, the second file that you want to bring over is your tool database. Uh, basically, on your tool database here, you want to export your selected tool groups. And uh, basically, if you do metric, both metric and or a metric, ah, imperial and metric, you'll do them one at a time, but you're going to export. Let's get that uh, question off the screen so you can see what I'm doing here. Uh, you're going to export that tool group and create that file, put it on a flash drive, and then you'll import it over. Now, one of the cool things about version 10 is uh, you actually can have your tool database file synchronize on your account up in your user portal. And all you would have to do is, uh, you know, download it down but uh you've got version 9.5 you don't have 10 yet so you don't have the benefits of that on computer a right now so would you would simply just export the files and then import them into your tool database uh on in version 10. those are the two main files that you want to bring over with regards to planet cnc um if you're going to be installing it on a new computer i highly recommend that you go to uh, vetric dot or not vetric.com, sorry, uh, digitalwoodcarver.com. <clears throat> and on the website, digitalwoodcarver.com, if it loads, go to owners, support and downloads. And um, let it finish loading. Bear with me a second. Here it comes. And then you're going to choose your setup files for your unit, whichever it is. Download those files and you can install the TNG. It's got all the profiles folders in there. It's got, you know, even the Vedric post processor files that we just talked about are in this folder. Everything you need for your machine to put on uh, your new computer. Along with instructions, there are video instructions right here. Um, and uh, that will walk you through that. And also there's a written PDF instructions in there as well. All right. Great. Okay. Uh, that brings up a, another question uh, from Jeff is, how do I save my tool database to the cloud? Well, basically in your Vetric software, you would open up your tool database and uh, you're online. So you would click on this little happy guy right there. And uh, that will take you to your Vetric account to log in. So you would log in. Okay, you would allow access. That will link your account to your uh, software. And once you've done that, you now can upload your current database to your portal or download your latest tool database from your portal. And that's how you would do that, Jeff. Okie dokie. All right. So let's get back to our compass rows and everything. Uh, where we left off 
we were getting ready to create the center medallion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my drawing tools and I'm going to grab a circle here and I'm going to snap right to the center and I'm going to pull this circle out uh, probably to right about there. I believe I'd be happy with that. And with that circle, I'm going to go back into the modeling tools and I'm going to go back into my create shape tool. Now this time I want a profile shape uh, and it's gonna have a 90 degree angle, this dome profile, right? Now uh, I'm gonna go, you know, if I went no limit, right? And I merged the, the, the piece and everything uh, and I click on that, I'm gonna have this dome right here, correct? You know, and that's not, that's not what I want. Um, what I want is I want that 90 degree profile, but I want to actually limit it to, in this case, I'm going to limit it to about a 16th of an inch, 0 0.0625, too many decimal points, 0 0.0625. And I'm going to give it some base height, uh, because when I limit that, when I click apply and limit that here, limit way down below the surface, right? There's nothing there. So I need to give it some base height and I know my parts are a half inch. So I want to be above that half inch. So I'm going to go 0 0.625 and click apply to bring that base up to, you know, a certain height. Now what my goal is, what I'd like to uh, see occur is I'd like to have uh, not that much above my main north, south, east and west. I don't want that much meat. Uh, there, but that limiting that to that 16th of an inch, what that does is gives me that nice rounded over edge because, you know, it was trying to dome, but then I flattened it out at a 16th of an inch and that gives me that nice round over. But I do want to lower my height some. So instead of 0 0.625, let's go 0 0.5 and see where we land at. Uh, too many decimal points. And then I'll kind of grow up from there. So let's, let's click apply and, um, yeah, that brings me right below that round over. And, uh, you know, I'm happy with that. Now, one of the things I want to look at is, uh, do I want my medallion to come all the way out to cover these flats here on my north, south, east, and west? Or am I good with it there? I'm pretty well good with it there. I, I don't need it. I don't need to make my circle, you know, big enough to, you know, cover that to where it's just points coming out. I mean, if I did, if I click here and um, if I zoom in, you can see the light area right here. I'd have to size my circle up to that. So if I if I did that out to, let's say, there and with it still selected, if I, you know, burn brought it back in, you know, that would bring me to here. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't like that as much. Me personally. Um, I think it's just too much. So I'm going to undo that and undo my resize. I kind of liked where I was. And one more time and then I'm just going to reapply my model there okay so I'm happy with that the way that looks now I'm gonna start a new component and what I'd like is I actually 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 uh, since I already clicked start a new component I'm gonna just go back to that uh, compass I'm gonna select it from my modeling tab and I'm gonna go back into the properties here and I'm going to give it just a little bit more base height, just a little bit more. I'm going to go an eighth of an inch, 0 0.125, uh, 125 higher, just to pump it up just a little bit. And there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, and uh, then I'm going to take my circle here. And I'm going to off, uh, basically hold the shift and control key down and I'm going to drag it in probably about to 
there. And that's going to create this little wall, right? This little lip. And I'm going to take this shape. And this time I'm going to subtract. I'm going to subtract this uh, from my part. And it's going to be a flat. And uh, I'm going to go down that eighth of an inch and I'm going to subtract gold from there uh, to kind of create this little divot. Now, I'm not worried about the hard edges and everything here because I'm going to be doing some smoothing uh, and stuff uh, when it's all said and done um, and, and all. And actually, let me see if I go down a little bit more than an eighth of an inch. Let me go a quarter. Let's go a quarter and see if I, I don't want to cut into my, uh, I don't want to see my spikes and things, which I don't, which is good. Okay, so we'll go a quarter of an inch. All right. So now that I've got that, uh, I'm going to go into my actual clip art now that comes with the software. And I'm going to go into my, uh, decorative clip art and um, or my objects and people. I could have put that anchor in there, right? You know, since it's kind of a nautical compass or what have you, but I'm going to actually put in a fleur de leaf. And let's see which one I want. I'll take this one. I'm going to drag and drop that in. And I'm going to size it down. It's going to pretend to be kind of like my little turn dial, my little needle, if you will. Uh, and I want to center that. Let's go back to our drawing tools. And I want to center that selected model uh, up on my material because my, my, my compass is centered and all. And then I've got to go into its properties. So I'm going to go back into my modeling tools and make sure I get that selected. I'm going to go back into its properties. And <clears throat> um, instead of merging the fleur de leaf, I'm going to add. So that way it'll sit on top here. And I'd like to give it just a little bit of base height, make it a little bit thicker on its bottom side. So I'm going to go uh, give it an eighth of an inch. Kind of give it some meat. Ah, uh, let's cut that in half. Let's go a sixteenth of an inch. Give me decimal points. Let that regenerate. It did not like that extra decimal point, so let's do that again. There we go. All right, cool. Very, very cool. Now, you guys with me? All right, let's see if we got any more, more questions. Um, Sherry Fuller, um, I struggle with visualizing cutting depths. Is that just learned or can I create a project to carve samples at depths to visualize for future projects? I mean, you can absolutely, um, uh, you know, create tool paths for uh, different, you know, projects and samples and everything with your different bits. Um, one of my, uh, you know, uh, favorite things to do is, is basically you could have a project, like if you're doing V carves, right? Um, you could create a series of lines on a project. And let's say you have, uh, you know, five of those lines using a 22 degree V bit one um, with no flat depth, you know, to see how far it cuts, uh, you know, or one in an, if you're doing a profile cut, you would need boxes if you're going to do the V carve. So if you're doing a profile cut, you know, one could be at a 16th of an inch, one could be at an eighth, uh, you know, on and on and on. And then with a 60 degree V bit, you could cut some and with a 90 degree V bit and you can create yourself a little chart of cut depths and everything. Uh, when it comes to V carve, you need closed vectors. 
uh, to do that. And, um, uh, you know, uh, you could do the same thing with your end mills. Uh, it doesn't have to be a V bit. You know, if you're doing a profile cut, you can do a 16th of an inch end mill cut, you know, with an eighth inch bit, then a quarter inch bit and, you know, or, or a 16th of an inch cut, then an eighth of an inch cut, then a quarter of an inch cut. You know, you can create this little sheets or cheat sheets and stuff with different cutting depths and all. Um, so that you can kind of get an idea of, of what that is, Sherry. Um, there is, uh, you know, uh, you can even use text and, you know, on, under each line, you could type in, you know, 90 degree V bit eighth inch cut. So you know what it is. You can have it V carve those, you know, those labels, if you will, in there and everything. Um, and, uh, you know, you can create that. Uh, let's see here. Jeff has a um, question here. Can I create a rounded top to an index card box in VCard Pro 10? Oh, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. Uh, VCard, so basically kind of a rounded top box is basically uh, creating a model. And that typically re requires a spire, but let's see what we can do in uh, VCard Pro. So let's say that this is my box lid here with square corners. Okay, that'll be my profile cut. That'll be my box lid that I'm cutting out. Um, I can go into the clip art tab here, my clip art. And one of the tools that we have in our clip art is our 3D tabs. In our 3D tabs, we have different uh, domed type uh, circular shapes. And so uh, I'm going to take this one here and drag it onto the board. I've got to log in and refresh so it drags the model on because the model I keep it up in my cloud so bear with me a second okay and let's do that again there we go all right so let's go kind of in uh, a 3d view here so you can see what this, basically this tab looks like here. And uh, let's split the view. Let's get out of this here. Split it side by side. And let's zoom into that. So I'm going to, in VCard Pro, I'm going to take and size my tab up. Just to where it's right outside of my vector border. And what that will do, that will give me my domed top and all. If I wanted more of a dome, I would go into the modeling tools, into the property, and I would adjust the shape height. Currently, right now, this is uh, 0.77 inches tall. If I was going to cut this out of, like, you know, let's say, a piece of eighth-inch material or whatever the case may be, um, uh, not eighth-inch, but, uh, you know, one-inch thick material or something, and I wanted a little bit of a dome, that's shape height. So if I give this, if I go one inch, that's going to build this shape up. Okay. If I go one and a half, that's going to build this shape up. Okay. It depends on how much of a dome you want for your, you know, if I go 0.3, if I go three quarters, then it's going to be just a nice curved top, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, you would have from there, you would have a 3D rough and a 3D finish cut um, using the, uh, you could use the selected vectors as the boundary. Let me get that uh, rectangle back in the center there. And um, the choice of the matter is, is if you want, you don't have to use this as your profile cutout because if you use this as your profile cutout, you're going to end up with a straight edge instead of a nice curved edge like this. So what I would probably do instead of that, I would size this, come into the size tool, 
and I would size this to the appropriate size of one. Let's say my box lid was, uh, you know, seven inches by uh, three and a half. Um, you know, I would size that lid appropriately. And then I would come into the modeling tab and use the boundary tool to create my boundary. And that would be my profile cut. So you would create your 3D rough and 3D finish cut on your model there. And then your profile cut uh, to cut it out. Now, if you want this to be a hollow lid, right? You want to uh, carve out the area inside. Uh, it's a two-sided project. Okay. Uh, basically, you would uh, be sizing this model down uh, by however much you want your lip to be, you know, uh, and copying that over to the other side. And um, that would be a concave. It would be a subtract. And so it would be cutting the material in a negative fashion on side two in a positive fashion on side one uh, to create that hollowed lid. Hopefully that answered your question, but yes, it's doable. And the quick and dirty tip is to use your 3D tabs, your rounded circular tabs here, uh, most likely the rectangular one, to create that domed top lid if you do not have a spire. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So I've got my, uh, what, where we're leaving off here on this compass rose um, is I've got my circle here that I'm going to use once again. Uh, and let's get into a 2D view for a moment. And what I'm going to do, let's get full screen here. I'm going to take this and once again uh copy and paste and this time i'm going to use the keyboard shortcut control c for copy control v for paste and now i can uh hold down my shift key don't don't need the control key i could have just used the control key to make a copy but i don't want to you know burn you guys out on shortcuts and all and i'm going to create this circle here and this time I am going to hold down my control and shift key and just drag out this circle here. All right, let's get some text in here as we're going along. Uh, Jeff, let me know if that answers your question uh, and uh, if you need anything else for that. Uh, let's open up my text tool. And uh, let's go with a nice N. For north and let's make this a uh, half inch tall right now till I can get it up here and snap it right in here uh, so I can see how tall I want my letters to be so let's go 625 oops not 225 625 that looks good all right so what I want to do is um, close this tool for a minute <clears throat> My distance here, my distance here, if I measured this, my offset, if you will, if I measured from this to this, my distance is roughly 0.9649. That's my magic number, right? Well, I want a center line. I need a center line to snap my letters to and stuff. So I'm going to go offset. And uh, 0.9649 divided by 2 equals, and I'm going to offset this vector outward, and that's going to give me my center line there. Okay. Now, if I look at node editing on that circle, I've got four main points, right? One, two, three, four. Perfect for my north, south, east, and west. So, um, Let's get out of node editing mode. What that means is, is I can take my N, if I double click on it, I can grab the center of my N and I can snap it right to that node on that center line and get it perfectly aligned. 
Okay. Uh, now we'll keep the text tool open and uh, let's uh, click off into here and let's go south. And let's drag that over and snap it right to that bottom node. Let's click over here somewhere and type in west. Snap that to there. Now on this one, west, uh, it's a little wide. So I will size that one down. So we'll make that 0.5. five that'll be good and then last but not least we'll go east and we'll snap that over to here and I'll keep that um, let's make sure I'm snapped to the center there snap right there oh bear with me oh right there Okay, I'll keep those two at a half inch tall and these two at the 0.65, give a little bit of variation in there. All right, now I have a choice. I can V carve these into these outer rings and let's get rid of this middle ring for right now. I can V carve these in or I can extrude them up because I'm working in Aspire and I can build shapes so I can actually build those 3D models up uh, into my outer ring, which I haven't made the outer ring yet. We're just kind of working with the text and stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, but what I'd like to do is, uh, we were talking about that circular array tool for creating, uh, you know, clock hands and stuff and all. Well, I want to show you how I like to use that circular array tool. Uh, when I'm doing something like this. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is notice that when I hover over this area, notice that dotted line that pops up here. You know, um, it's showing me right where that point is and stuff. So I can click my line here and go up to the top and click it there and space bar to finish. And that gives me my line here. Now, I'm going to take that line and... Um, if I go into that circular array tool, the center of my object is six inches by six inches. Okay. Cause my object's 12 by 12. Remember? So my center point is six by six. And I want to take that 360 degrees around. And I want to divide that. Right. I want to divide that by 45 degrees. It equal. And that's going to give me eight lines. And so I want to copy those around. And that's going to give me my eight points right here. And notice that line's right in line there and right in line there and all that wonderful stuff. Now, I'm going to be deleting the lines over the uh, E's, the W's, the S, and the North and all. But I digress. Let's go back here and let's click on that. And this time, I'm going to go... Uh, 360 degrees uh, divided by 22.5 equals 16. So we'll click that and create those marks, right? And then I'd also like to uh, select on that northern one again. And I'd like to go 360 degrees this time before I do the northern one. Bear with me. Uh, I actually want to take and size it down about like so. Basically, let me snap it to the bottom here. And I want to kind of size it to halfway mark right there. Okay. And I'll leave it like that. And so once again, I'll go into my circular array tool. Uh, make sure I'm six by six on my center. And I'm going to go 360 degrees uh, divided by five degrees. Okay. Oops. Equal key. 72 of them bad boys. So every five degrees, I would like to have a little mark. All right. And these are going to be kind of profile cut in to my model. Or I could, you know, um, you know, do something with them. I could, you know, subtract them out to create little indents. 
All right. So now I've got some marks and on my 22 degree marks. Um, I don't want them the same length as my 45s. So let me undo twice. Okay. And let's, uh, let's take this Northern line and let's bring it down about a third of the way down. And let's do that one more time real quick. Uh, we've got uh, 360 divided by 22.5 equals 16. And whoops, didn't change my rotation center, six by six. There we go. All right, and then take this line and bring it down to the halfway mark like that. Was that the halfway mark? And that's going to be the 360 degrees divided by five degree increments and copy that around. Oop, once again, didn't change my center, that rotation center. Very important. Six by six. There we go. All right. So now once again, I'm not going to keep the line on the north. That's going to get deleted. Uh, the lines on the 45 degrees notice that my 45 degree line uh, that I have a 22 degree mark uh, underneath it right and then I also have a five degree mark you know uh, here so I kind of need to go through and delete that one select on this top one delete that you know so I just have that 45 degree mark um, and I put probably uh, you know need to make sure it's a duplicate vector but not really so it's fine uh, but this one's going to get all three lines deleted this one's going to get all three lines and you know i'm just selecting the lines one at a time uh, so it'll select the short one first then the mid-sized one then the long one right to create those and again um you know on my duplicates here those little five degree marks, I can click on that, then click on the 22 degree mark. And that way I just have my, you know, 45, my 22 degree mark, um, you know, is good there. Uh, that one's good. That one's good. That one I took care of. That one I took care of. That one's good. This one has the three lines. So delete that one, delete that one, and that'll leave me with that. Good. This one's good. Good. This one, delete the short line, delete the middle size line, and then leave that one. And I'm good all the way around. Okay. So now we got to go back to the create shape tool. And the first shape that I'm going to create <clears throat> excuse me the first shape i'm going to create is my outside shape here i'm going to select both of these vectors and i'm going to come in here and again i want a domed profile 90 degrees because i want a nice little round over on both of these edges and stuff um and so i want a domed profile 90 degrees i'm going to go a half inch uh tall and uh, probably no point. Yeah, half inch tall is good. Uh, and, but I want to limit this to a sixteenth of an inch. And we're going to click merge. I will merge in a moment. Click apply. Okay, that's going to create this outer ring here. Okie dokie. All right, let's go. Let's give this a little bit of height 0. 0.625 instead of uh, a half an inch on the base height. There we go. And start a new component. Then I'm going to this inside circle here, not the line, the inside circle. And that's going to be a flat profile. And it's only going to, I'm going to go an eighth of an inch an eighth of an inch and I'm going to merge that and that's going to create like a little base plate uh, down here. Okay. 
Now, I've merged this with this outside profile and it actually has taken away some of my needles. It actually came up, you know, and taken away some of my points here, you know, uh, give you an example. If I went up a quarter of an inch and click apply, you know, my needle shorter and shorter and shorter, right? I don't want that to happen. So what I want to do is, uh, I want that to be that eighth of an inch. I kind of want these two models here and my compass model to be separate. So if I go into tree here, I'm actually going to create a new level and I'm going to take those last two shapes that I created and I'm going to move them onto the lay. And what that will do is this level by default is an add mode. This level by default is an add mode, meaning I'm adding this to this. That means my compass model is going to sit on top of this flat plate here. And I don't lose any of my, you know, my, my, my depth and stuff in there. By the way, tell me if I'm boring you guys or if you're enjoying this because uh, there's no other questions popping up. Uh, oh, wait, I do have a question. Let's pause for a moment now that we've got that next up. In Aspire, is Aspire the only modeling program that can be used with this CNC machine? With uh, the digital woodcarver? No. You can use uh, Vetric. Uh, you can use SolidWorks. You can use Fusion 360, ArtCam. Any one of them. It doesn't have to be uh, Aspire. DJ, good question. Uh, Dave has a great question. He says, Laney, last week you touched on rest machining. If there's time tonight, could you address this? Absolutely, I can address that. Um, I surely can. And uh, let's take a moment from here. And let's go into another Aspire. And then I want to talk to you about two rail sweeps after we're done with this. Uh, and then we'll kind of start kind of wrapping things up. I'm going to create a new file here. And um, I'm going to, uh, let's go 24... by 15 by one and a half. All right. And let me go into modeling and let me import a model. Whenever you import a third party model file, uh, the first thing you have to do is orientate that model. So uh, here in just a second, the orientation window will pop up. It's gonna be a little slow because I do have three Aspire windows open and models in all three of them. So give it just a moment. Okay. So the first thing I need to do is I need to orientate this model. Um, we'll let the orientation window come up. There we go. It's already in its top orientation. So that's correct. Uh, the only thing I need to do is size this down. Um, if I go 24, Let's go 22 inches. That'll fit within my 16 and click apply uh, to size that down to size. Uh, then I'm going to center my model. When I click on center model, if I go into the Y orientation here, uh, that's putting the model uh, into the center of my board. And we need the model to be above the zero plane. So we're going to lower the zero plane, which essentially raises the model 
above that zero plane. And you can use this, like if your model has too much base on the back of it, you know, some creators create a lot of base on the back and you want to cut some off. You can adjust this to where some of that base is below that black line, that zero plane. Um, and then you can just discard any data that's below that zero plane. In this case, there's no data to discard. I need it all the way above the zero plane. And then I'm going to click OK. Right. Uh, how long will it take to cut this out? If you're talking about the compass rose, I have no idea. It's not finished being created yet. So I haven't even gotten anywhere near tool pass yet. All right. So on this model here, uh, we have some fine detail uh, kind of in the map in the background and around this uh, ship and all uh, and in here and all. So let's uh, come over and let's create a uh, tool path. So the first tool path, I'll do a 3D rough cut. Uh, I'm going to use, uh, let's go ahead and first of all, create a boundary for this because I'm not going to waste time on this wasted material up here. In the modeling tab, I'm going to create a vector boundary around the outside. And uh, we're going to use that selected vector as the machining boundary. With my rough cut bit, I'm just going to use a quarter inch end mill. and calculate that rough cut. And what we're talking about is rest machining, setting up a rest machining job. All right, so uh, this rough cut, and by the way, let's stop, let's stop this for a moment. Um, let's go to tool pass, simulation quality. Let's turn that down just a little bit for time sake and speed. Uh, let's go ahead and we, now we can preview that rough cut. Um, get that uh, rough cut out. And I'm going in the wrong direction. I should be rastering along the x-axis, but that's okay. This is just to show how to set up rest machining. Okay, so on my rough cut, all right, that's going to hog away the waste material and everything. Uh, now I'm going to come in and do my finish cut. Now, here's where rest machining comes in. I can do my finish cut uh, with a larger diameter bit, and then I can come back and do the rest of the design where that bit really couldn't fit in with a smaller diameter bit and just do the rest of the design. If we're using VCarve Desktop Pro uh, or generally Aspire without rest machining, when we create a finished toolpath, it's the whole model, the, the old visible model that toolpath is getting created with. If I created a finished toolpath with a eighth inch end mill, and then I turn around and create a finished toolpath with a 16th inch end mill, it's carving the whole model with both bits, which is a waste of time. Uh, what we, what our goal is, is to carve uh, a majority of the model with a larger diameter bit and then to come back and do the detail work with a smaller diameter bit and do what's called rest machining. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my quarter inch tapered ball nose, which is... Bear with me a second here. Stand by real quick. I'm going to bring in my tools. Uh, I don't know why my tools are not in here like they should be. Let me see here. Hold on a second. That's 16th. That's also a 16th. And that's um, 30 seconds. All right, stand by one second. We're going to bring in, uh, I'm going to create a new library here. DWC Tool Library.
click apply and OK. On that tool library, I'm going to import a file. Uh, that is in my documents. Planet CNC. Setup files, tool files. Okay. And all right. So I need my quarter inch tapered ball nose, which is right there. <clears throat> I'm going to use, uh, since I'm going to be cutting this profile out, I'm going to be using the selected vector as the boundary. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and calculate this tool path. Now, knowing that the quarter inch ball nose uh, is not going to give me hardly any detail at all, but it's going to hog away a majority of that material. Um, and, uh, it's going to, you know, using this larger email is definitely going to force me to go back with a smaller bit and, uh, you know, touch up the detail. Even if I was using an eighth inch, I'd probably want to go back with a 32nd or even a 16th to do some of the fine detail on the map and stuff. Uh, but the main goal is, is to get that, you know, first tool path, uh, Finished. Now, if we look at if we look at this um, finish cut uh, with the quarter inch end mill, let it uh, run through here. <clears throat> Almost there, guys and girls. All right, so if we take a very close look at this, you can see all the tool marks and everything where that quarter inch bit just couldn't get down into these areas to do the uh, detail. Okay. So I'm definitely going to have to, you know, that it served the purpose of hogging away the waste material, but it definitely, you know, left tool marks and all because it just could not get into that detail and everything. So I'm definitely going to have to come back and do a, um, uh, rest machining job on this. All right. So uh, first things first, get this into the Z orientation, uh, you know, on your screen. And then you're going to come over to the modeling tab up here. And you're going to come down and create a component from, create a component from the toolpath preview. Now, before you click this, you want to be holding your control key. That's the whole trick to the rest machining. You want to hold the control key down and then click create a component from the toolpath preview. Okay. What that's going to do is over here in our component tree, we're going to have a toolpath preview model that's been created. And if I come in and close my preview window for a moment, and you see our model here. If I turn off our actual model, you will see the preview model. And what it's done by holding the control key down, it's created almost like kind of a negative of all of the areas where the quarter inch bit could not fit. All of these little areas that are raised up here and all are where that quarter inch bit could not fit. It kind of creates a negative, if you will. Um, so we turn off our model and we only have the toolpath preview visible and we go into the 2d view. Now notice here in the 2d view, you see all these white highlights and everything. 
that's the areas that the eighth inch or the quarter inch bit couldn't fit where we need a smaller bit. So what we want to do is we want to trace these areas, all these light areas and stuff. Uh, and we're going to come back and carve them with a smaller bit. So we're going to go into our drawing tools and open up the trace bitmap tool. This is step number two. First step is creating that component from your toolpath preview, holding your control key. Second step is to turn off your actual model, leaving the toolpath preview model visible. Number three, go into the trace bitmap tool. Select on your model. You're going to slide this model all the way to one side to where you have a white background here. <laughs> okay. And then if you have a roller wheel on your mouse, it's helpful. But basically we are going, watch my numbers here. I'm going to tick up one number at a time until I get to, boom, here, right here. Okay, so boom, we want to see that full glory. Now, I could keep going, but the more I keep going, the less detail that I'm going to carve, right? You know, I don't, I want to, I want to get as, I want to go in and clean up as much as I can. So this is the areas, all of these areas, all these white areas are where my other bits going to come and clean up. So once again, bring it all the way over to the left and one tick at a time, the minute you get to that, boom, preview, then you want to come down Use your default corner fit, uh, noise filter, default noise filter is fine, and click on preview. And if we turn the fading off, you can really see, you know, if we click on preview, it'll trace all of those vectors. Okay. Click apply and close. Now we're going to come back over to our 3D finish cut. We're going to select our vectors. OK, and we're going to use uh, put our model back up at the top here. Now, before we go carving anything, it's most absolute important that we turn off that toolpath preview and turn our actual model back on. OK, the actual model, turn your actual model back on. All right. Or else you're uh, going to have a bad day. Um, we want to calculate this now using the, um, let's get out of this. We want to come back in here using the selected vectors. Now I'm going to change my bit and I'm going to use my, uh, we'll go with the eighth inch tapered ball nose or even my 16th, either one. Uh, let's go with my 16th inch tapered ball nose. All right, using the selected vectors as the boundary, I'm going to come in and calculate that toolpath. That's going to create a toolpath just to carve within the areas of these vectors. And that is the rest machining. Okay, it's going to come back and do the rest of this design, carving in these little areas where the big bit could not fit. Okay, now rest machining is not always a time saver, you know, sometimes depending on the size of our smaller bit and stuff, sometimes the rest machining process, um, you know, uh, could be, you know, more. I could go and create a toolpath on, uh, you know, create this toolpath with my uh, eighth inch bit right? My eighth inch ball nose, do the, create that, you know, tool path preview again, holding the control key down and then create another, a third tool path with my 16th inch ball nose, right? I could keep, I could create three tool paths, three rest machining processes, uh, doing smaller and smaller and smaller areas each time if I wanted to. But, um, generally, you know, it's just going to be the one, 
Uh, but absolutely, you know, you could just keep building and building and building on it. Uh, and however many tool changes you want to do. All right. Now that's going to take just a moment to calculate out while that calculates out. Let's kind of get back to our compass rows here. Uh, and um, when we left off, we moved our outside border and our little plate down there. We moved them to another level so that our compass would sit on top of them and not be swallowed by the merging of these two pieces. Now, like I said, if I wanted to, I could take my north, south, east, and west, and I could come in and create like the northwest, southwest letters and all that stuff and all, but I'm just going to go north, south, east, and west. And I could actually come in and create a shape of these. Um, you know, let's say have them kind of stand proud about a sixteenth of an inch and have them add to that model to where they're just sitting on top. And uh, let's go, let's go a little bit more than a sixteenth of an inch. And instead of rounded edges like that or, or square edges and all, let's uh, pump it up. We're going to go rounded edges, 90 degrees with an inch, um, point one, two, five, but we're going to limit it. We're going to limit it. And this time, since these are small letters anyway, I'm limiting it to a 30 second. So point zero three one two five. Click apply. And these little roundovers on my edges of my small letters. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. So I've got those built up. Now I'm going to close this and on this, uh, these letters here, I'd like to have them instead of straight up and down, I'd like to give them a little bit of a draft, if you will, a uh, little bit of a draft. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and turn off here, uh, kind of hide them for a moment. I'm going to turn off my entire level. And that's just going to leave my north, south, east, and west. And with that component, I'm going to come up here and um, because it creates a draft on the visible model, right? So I only need this model visible. And I'm going to go and give this a little 22 and a half degree angle draft. And to take the edge walls of the letters here and draft them out like that. Give them some nice angle and everything. Once I've done that, now I have my model with my draft. I don't need the actual original, but I do want to come back in my other two uh, parts. Of course, the rest of my. Okay. And my model with the draft. Um, I need to change the combine mode of that to an add back on top where they are. And so now I've got, you know, this here. Let's check in on our rest machining. Still calculating, could take a moment. All right, now uh, this kind of completes the modeling phase of the compass rows. Now I'm going to come in and do some uh, vectoring and texturing, or not vectoring, but, uh, you know, uh, kind of profile cutting, if you will, uh, on these little lines and stuff. So, uh, or I could actually, like, if I took these, um, I'll give you an idea. I think it needs to be a closed vector uh for a shape tool let me find out i'll do one uh it'll be a flat profile uh let's go 0.04 and subtract takes away a little line Yeah, it's got to be a closed vector. So it's got to be a closed vector. Now, um, dun, 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 dun. all right, 
we'll cancel that one out. All right, let's come in here and create a, uh, let's go over here and create some tool paths. On this here, uh, I'm going to have a rough cut, 3D rough cut. And uh, I'm going to make sure my model, right now my model exceeds my material thickness because of these little letters sticking up. You know, they made it uh, stick up, uh, you know, above my three quarters. So I'm going to click on set my model height and I'm just going to bring it right to, uh, we'll bring it a little less than three quarters. We'll go 0.74. That'll give me a 10,007 inch little skin. Click apply. And check on our rest machining. It's still calculating. It's not responding right now. It'll catch up to itself in a moment. I've just got so many files open. It's uh, it's um, kind of hard. Now on my model here, I'm gonna just throw that ten thousandths of an inch uh, right up at the top, so it can get milled away. My model's below that. And um, that'll ensure that I don't have any flat spots on the top of my model and stuff. And so I'm going to use the selected vectors of boundary because this is going to get cut out. So uh, I'm going to use this selected vector as the boundary. I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill and I'm going to Z level uh, raster cut this or Z level um, cut this rough cut this with my quarter inch end mill. Let that calculate. Let's go into a full screen view here and preview that selected toolpath. And this, this is, you know, we use the star tool. We've uh, made copies of that star. We sized it down. We rotated it a few times. Uh, we use the circle tool. We, you know, made copies of that circle tool, rotated it a few times. Uh, we created text. And this is just, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice little model. Um, it's just a nice little way to practice uh, your modeling and stuff, your combined modes and your merging and your adding uh, in things, you know, uh, your different shapes and stuff. Uh, it's a nice little uh, way to practice. And it also creates a model that's scalable. I could scale this down and put this on quarter boards that I, where we talked about last week. Uh, I could scale it up and, uh, you know, uh, do some really cool things with it. But um, my rough cut is uh, slow to cut because I'm, I didn't change the uh, quality level on this one. It's almost there. Rest machining is still calculating. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to our rest machining and let's see if I can. It's like almost there. I know it's going to pop off any moment. I don't want to really click on it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't want to freeze it up. So just be patient with it. There's a lot of little vectors that that little bit has got to get into. I'm using a uh, 16th inch end mill. Um, and uh, Jeff, uh, I appreciate that. Jeff says, see you in Columbus. We are going to be in Columbus. Uh, Jeff, I will not be at the Columbus show. Um I will not be doing Columbus. You'll be meeting Burl and the guys there. Uh, they're closer based out of Indiana. So uh, it was not feasible to fly me up to the Columbus show and everything. So I will not be there. All right. So once that rough cut is done, then we're going to uh, come back in with our finish bit, our finishing toolpath, 3D finish toolpath. And on this case, there's not a whole lot um, uh, to this and everything. Uh, so I'm going to uh, use my eighth inch end mill. I believe I should get enough detail with it. My eighth inch tapered ball nose, not end mill. Tapered wall nose. Um, and again, using the selected vector as the boundary, we'll calculate that out. Let that calculate. And the last thing we're going to wrap up with tonight, uh, besides the answer, I don't see any questions. Uh, um, 
Aaron, uh, you you said cuts below the model. Um, let me know what you meant by, beside that. Uh, you, you're saying the cut is below the model that uh, it um, needed some base height on that single line. Let's uh, let this uh, finish calculate. Let's go back and let's validate that. I think it has to be a closed vector, but I could be wrong. Uh, Aaron's uh, saying that uh, possibly that little negative cut was below down at the bottom because it was merging instead of adding, right? But I use the subtract method, which is not a merge method. So um, we will uh, want to check that out and see. All right, let's close this tool for a moment. And um, I really want to stop this rest machine and recalculate it. I'm not sure what's what's the junction malfunction. I think once I close up some of these models, let's while while these two are calculating out on the finish cuts, let's talk about our last little tip I wanted to show you. I wanted to talk to you about, I want you to take a look at these uh, models here. And I want you to look at these transitions. Uh, the top model transitions from this kind of curved profile to a rounded dome to a pointed top and then down to this negative cut on this one here think of like a little tree branch vine or a little leaf uh you know stem or something goes from a wider profile and tapers down not only to a smaller diameter but also a lower height to give that you know that definition of thickness and everything and that is done by using your two rail sweep tools and multiple profiles. So on this top profile here, if we delete this, basically in your two rail sweep tool, you have uh, what's called cross sections. Uh, so first of all, our drive rails are these two rails here. And that'll be our selection, our drive rails. Now, Within these drive rails, if I swept this profile across, it's going to go from, you see this little red mark here? It's going to go from here to here. So if I applied that and we look at our 3D view, I've got this little curved profile that sweeps all the way across between those two rails for a nice piece of trim. Okay. But in the case of this, I actually want to uh, have it transition from this to this rounded piece. And I'm going to throw that transition in right about here. So when I click here, it's going to give me a kind of a start point or a transition point, And it's going to also put that same color on this profile. So this profile will run from here to here. And then it will start to merge and start to slowly transition into this one. Okay. Not a hard stop. It's going to gradually start shifting into this one. And then from here, let's say that I want to transition from here to here on this one. I can assign this profile from, you know, from this point. And let's say that I want this one to actually kind of, you know, start back here as long as i've got it selected and i click on i can kind of create a start to finish point you know so it's just going to do from here to there and then on my last model i'm going to click here and that means it's from this point it's going to start transitioning into uh this piece here now if i wanted to i could say you know while that's selected i could say start this transition from here to here just by clicking on it and changing the color and when i do that and click apply that's going to create this piece of profile that um, starts off 
let me get into a position here, starts off with that curved profile and then blends into that nice arched profile, which then transitioned into that kind of house roof profile, which then transitioned into that negative profile, creating this kind of like a spoon, if you will. And the whole point of that is, is there's times like, you know, if you're making wooden spoons <laughs> and things like that, you know, this would be a nice little tip or trick. Uh, to create that transition uh, from the handle down into the spoon, you know, of the model area and things, you know, those cross sections and all. Uh, another example is, uh, let's say on our stem here, let's say on our stem here, I've got these two arches, um, there, you know, these two lines creating this little stem branch and all, and I want it to be nice and fat and wide you know, for the most part, but then I want it to kind of be, you know, smaller, lower and, you know, skinnier basically as it transitions. So in my two rail sweep tool, this works with one rail sweep as well, your cross sections and all. And um, yes, the, yes, William, the screen was not responding. I'm letting it catch up to itself. But if I select the drive rails here and then I select my first profile and I click here, that's going to sweep that profile from this red point to that red point unless I create a transition. So I'm going to select on this profile now and I'd like it to start transitioning somewhere right about here. Okay. And I'd like it to run from here to here. And when I sweep that across, what that does is that's going to take my that piece of molded trim and then right about here it's going to start shrinking down lower and lower and getting smaller and smaller and you know spanning between that that span so many people just you know when they do two rail sweeps they create their two rails they create their profile and they sweep it and they don't know a whole lot about cross sections you can assign cross sections anywhere you know if i selected this profile and threw it right in here right? I just created a cross section of this little dome shape. And if I, you know, come in here and let's say I bring that dome shape to there, right? Then what I'm going to end up with is if I create this profile, it's going to sweep that rounded shape from here to here. Then it's going to start transitioning into this kind of, you know, pointed, not really pointed shape, but little rounded shape. And then from there, it's going to start transitioning into my round curve. And if we take a look at that, it would look something like this. So that nice round shape then transitions into that kind of dome shape and then transitions into that smaller curve shape. And that's how you create different kind of unique uh, transitions and things uh, within your models and your frames and stuff like that uh, and all and everything. And uh, Warren, uh, these two tools right here, the two rail sweep tool, this is an aspire to be done in Big Carve Desktop. Okay. So uh, get to know cross sections and working with cross sections. And one of the cool ways to do that is on the two rail sweep tool, uh, we can click on the get help on this within the software. And um, in that uh, get help on this page, uh, we can uh, get information on cross section selection, which kind of explains uh, cross sections and how you can take two different profiles to create, you know, instead of just that simple curved profile here, we can put ribs in it, you know, by creating that ribbed profile and having it kind of run through there and stuff uh, and everything. And, uh, you know, just like with molding profiles and stuff and collecting nodes and everything. So a great way to kind of learn about your tools and stuff. But I wanted to kind of firsthand show that tool about how you can kind of transition based on your profiles and things. All right, let's get back to uh, where we're at here. So on this cut, uh, the 3D finish. Let's preview that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the simulation quality down uh, low so we can get through time's sake. 
because I want to get back to that rest machining and wrap that one up as well um, and, and everything. Um, yeah, Jeff, I am listed as someone doing a seminar at the show. Uh, the woodworking shows uh, did not update their website or their flyers or anything. I did three of their shows this year uh, and they had me down and all, as all of them and they just didn't change it on their website. Now, just like, uh, you know, you know, on rust machining and stuff, if I wanted to, I could come back and uh, on my letters here, use a smaller diameter bit and just focus on those letters and all and do the rest of the model, you know, like we did on there. Uh, but now I've got my model here. Let's go ahead and create our final uh, tool pass. In this case, we're going to select everything. And I'm going to hold down my shift key and deselect uh, the inside vectors. I'm going to deselect my north, south, east, and west. Holding down my shift key, I'm going to deselect my outer rings there. So all I have are just my lines. Uh, and in the case of this, we're going to go ahead and it's going to be a profile cut. I'm going to use a small 22 degree V bit. Um, I could use my 60 or 90, but uh, I'm going to use my 22 degree as soon as I track her down. And I want to be carving on the line. I want to carve uh, just about a sixteenth of an inch, maybe more. We'll see. Sixteenth uh, of an inch on the line um, on these vector lines here. And I want to project project the toolpath down onto the 3D model. Very important. This is a 2D toolpath, and I've got a 3D model here, so I need to project it down onto the 3D model. We calculate that out. If we take a uh, kind of a quick preview here. Um, so we've got our lines there. Let's go slightly a little bit deeper with that. Um, let's go. Point one. Calculate that out. There we go. A little bit of definition in there. And there is our little cut. Now, um, where'd he go? Hold on a minute. Aaron said that the cut was down at the bottom when I was trying to make a model out of these parts so they would be extruded up word uh let's validate that i don't believe that's the case but let's let's double check it never hurts to you know i don't know everything so uh we're going to go into our modeling tools over here and with these selected i'm going to go to my modeling tools and i'm going to create a flat profile i'm going to go Eighth of an inch, I mean decimal points. And I will add them first. That way, if I add them, I can see them pop up and then we can validate that. But you see, it won't let me select the apply here. Um, the apply function will not turn on. However, if I come in here and select these two surrounding those, Let's see if that will subtract these lines. I don't think it will. I think it's going to totally ignore the open vectors, but let's find out. So on our base height, we're going to go 0.625. Um, we're going to limit that height and we'll merge and click apply. I think it's going to ignore the uh, vectors. And so something happened here. And it's basically where these vectors are closed off. It's kind of created these 
funky model. Let's take a look at what that looks like. And let's turn off our other model, which is this one, I believe. Yep. Yeah. So it's getting those dashes, but it's kind of creating this funky issue here. Um, and I could counteract that by, if I would have drawn instead of lines, little rectangles, that would have worked for me. But the single lines are not going to work for me. In this case, is simply profile cut them in uh, to create those little dials. And had I used a 60 degree V-bit, uh, they would have been wider, uh, 90 degree V-bit wider, you know, so on and so forth. But um, that would be our little compass rows. The final cut on this would be with that final selected vector would be the profile cut to cut this part out. And um, we're gonna be on the outside of the line. We'll use a quarter inch end mill. and calculate. The letters, I want to kind of come back and clean up those letters. So this is not technically a rest machining. Um, I'm simply going to come in here and select my letters, which should be the uh, model with the draft here. Let's close this for a moment. The model with the draft, uh, I'm going to basically uh, 3D finish cut even though I got the model selected I don't have the vector selected so with this I'm going to create a boundary around them. Okay. And I'm going to use the selected vector as a boundary. This time I'm going to use a very small 32nd inch tip bit. Tapered ball nose. And selected vectors calculate that toolpath. I actually let it, uh, sorry, let me go back in there real quick. I wanted to let it go past the, um, I want to go, let it go past the line by a sixteenth of an inch. So it blends it in with the rest of this. <clears throat> And then uh, preview that selected toolpath, and let's see if that, there we go. Much cleaner. Okay. So select the vectors on that one. All right. We're going to go ahead, and I'm going to save this one. I'm going to close this. If you guys have any questions, I'll reopen it. But uh, we're going to go back to our desktop. Oh, I wanted to add some little embellishments. I wanted to draw some circles in here and create some little rivets on this upper ring. Dang, I'm gonna forgot to do that. Well, anyway, you would just draw your circles and create a shape, nice little dome shape to create some rivets in there uh, and stuff, little uh, little dimples and stuff. But yeah, you could something you could play around with. Um, all right, let's close this out. Let's close this Aspire out. That brings us back to here. Um, let's come in here and close this out. So we're only dealing with that. Let's see if I can uh, stop that 
from calculating and see if I can come back and fix it. I think it's going to crash on us. Uh, and uh, if it does, I apologize. But it's 947. Let's end up with some last minute questions. Um, oh, the cuts at the bottom. Did the model. I wonder if that's why it's taken so long. Aaron, okay. I thought you were talking about the lines. Aaron says, hey, sorry, but that was that comment was for rest machining. I thought uh, that was, oh, I bet you, I wonder if that's why it's taken so long to calculate uh, because uh, I didn't change the model position in the material and bring it back to the top. I thought I did, but that could very well be the reason why. Um, let's see if, uh, <clears throat> okay, let's see if we can take the last 10 minutes and recreate that very quickly. Let's open up a spire. And what I'm going to do is I'll just size the project down a little bit. So we will go, uh, create a new file, uh, 24 by 15 is good. Click OK. Let's go into and import a model. <clears throat> On that model, let's orientate it and size it down. Work with me, Aspire. A little faster there, buddy. Okay, let's size this down a bit. Um, let's go, let's go 18 inches by 12, click apply, size that down, center that model. Bring it above the zero plane. and click OK. All right. Have a good night, Ronnie. Thank you. All right. Once again, we're going to pop over here. Uh, well, first of all, let's create our vector boundary on our selected model. So we have that to work with. All right. We're going to create, I'm just going to create a 3D finish uh, cut. We're going to go in here and we're going to use our quarter inch ball there it is uh, selected vector is the boundary no boundary offset um, let's make sure my model is positioned correctly up at the top there where it needs to be thank you let's uh, fix that all right, selected vector is the boundary. We're going to raster cut this and calculate. Let that calculate quickly, quickly, quickly. All right, guys, uh, last uh, 10 minutes here. Let's go ahead and ask some questions if you have them. I'll do my best to answer them. I might not be able to demonstrate anything because I do want to get through this, uh, but I can answer it verbally uh, to the best of my ability if you have anything. Uh, yeah, man. Ronnie, thanks, man. Give me a thumbs up uh, if you like this. If you got any information out of tonight's class, uh, let's go ahead and preview that selected tool path. <clears throat> Hopefully you were able to um, get some information out of tonight's class and, you know, maybe something that will help you guys and girls. All right, let's uh, pull this into a top view here and uh, we're going to go over to our modeling tab, create component from, hold down that control key and click on the uh, create component from toolpath preview. It creates our toolpath preview. Let's get back into full screen here. Um, turn off your actual original model. 
Let me go. And go into your 2D view. Trace bitmap tool. Select your model. Slide this all the way down. And then we're going to tick up slowly until we get to that point right about now coming. There we go. Right there. Okay. Uh, we're going to preview that. Let it trace out those vectors. Click apply and close. All right. We're going to come back over here. We're going to go into our modeling tab and turn off that toolpath preview and turn our model back on. We're going to go into our job setup, make sure that our model is still at the top of the material, uh, which it is. So we're good there. We're going to select our vectors here, our trace vectors here. And um, we're going to create a, another finished toolpath. Uh, select the vectors of the boundary. This time we're going to use a smaller bit. I'm going to come down and I'm going to use my I'm going to use my eighth inch tapered ball nose. Click select. And calculate that. One open vector is going to be ignored. There's a thousand other remaining vectors. So it's got to calculate those thousand remaining other vectors. That's probably why it's not responding. Um, there we go. Racing through this time now. <clears throat> that deserves a double stuffed Oreo. I'm gonna Hey, Mike Smith. Welcome back. We are wrapping up here in the next few minutes. As soon as this toolpath calculates, come on, Patrick. Don't steer me wrong this time now. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. It's not responding up at the top. It is. Um, it's got a thousand vectors to look through and it's trying to figure out the best way to create that toolpath. I probably should have picked a less complicated model, but, you know, for the demonstration purposes, but, you know, you got to see how things act. Over here, munching on double stuffed Oreos while this thing is calculating. Um, all right. What in the world? Let's do this. Let's, is it going to let me stop it or is it going to crash if I stop it? Let me see if it'll stop it without crashing. I think the raster, trying to raster in between those small little lines is creating the uh, issue. Um, most likely, and I'm, you know, I would prefer to raster to cut with the grain, but it's probably causing the issue uh, more so than an offset toolpath would have, uh, you know, allowed it to kind of go around and around and fit in those areas and stuff instead of trying to raster these small little movements, you know, and stuff. Um, 
but uh, this is the raster. Uh, this is the uh, rest machining process here, and we're just basically we're trying to create that second tool path for the rest of the job. And unfortunately, I don't know if my computer's taxed out because of my Adobe or what. Um, but it has just not got the processing power tonight to do it and the model itself. Mm -mm -mm. Hopefully it's not causing a lot of buffering and all on my stream. I don't think it is, but uh, good night, Troy. Until next time. Guys and girls, I do not think, uh, and Dave Garbett, hopefully it's the process you, you follow, but hopefully you kind of see how to create that rest machining, you know, those vectors and all for that toolpath and everything. Um, but uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to finish this one out. I, it's, it's just crashing on us. Um Unfortunately, let's see here. <clears throat> I've got a Tim. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Um, but, uh, I don't, I just don't think it's going to, uh, let us tackle it. Um, let me see. I will attempt this one last last minute and a half here but I look and then I think we got to say good night um, all right let me size this down it, it didn't even ask me to it didn't even ask me to orientate it this time it's like psh, we're just bringing it in all right I'm gonna make this small create my boundary and I'm going to uh, come in and create a finished toolpath. This time, again, let's one more time. I got my quarter inch ball nose bit. Selected vector is the boundary, which is that vector right there. And uh, I'm going to offset this instead of raster cut it. <clears throat> let's see if. Um, that changes anything now my bigger my bigger tool path i could have raster cut that one but we're going to wrap this up if this doesn't work okay preview that selected tool path let it rip and roar go through there All right, model, create component from, hold down that control key, click on create component from toolpath preview. Go into the modeling tab, turn off the actual model, go into the 2D view tab, open up the drawing tools, trace bitmap tool, click on our model, slide it all the way out and tick in slowly till we get right where we need, which is there. Um, we could probably fine tune that a little bit. Let's see here. We'll fine tune that one extra notch right there. <coughs> um, preview those vectors, click apply and close. This time, this time on these vectors, 
this time on these vectors, I'm going to raster cut them or uh, offset cut them. Let's do a finished cut. Let's go uh, bring that model back up. First of all, turn off that toolpath preview. Turn on your actual model. Very important. Put that model up at the top where it belongs. And we're going to create a toolpath with our tapered ball nose. I'm going to offset this one this time. See if that makes a difference. Calculate. One open vector was identified once again. So we'll let that calculate. And let's see if it'll go through this time. Okay. Well, that's a good sign. That little yellow bar is moving. Let's see what happens on this third pass here. Right there in the middle. You can do it. <laughs> here it comes. Okay. Come on. This should be the last pass here. We might have had it this time. Let's see. You're welcome, Jim. Thanks, Dave. Um, Dave, I'm glad you got the procedure. It's the same steps for any rest machining process, uh, but it's actually going through now. So we'll get to see the end result and see kind of the difference of what that rest machining does for us and everything. <clears throat> it's approaching the finish line. It's like the tortoise and the hare and the tortoise is winning. <clears throat> All right, now let's take a, let's uncheck that real quick and let's take a quick look here. And as you can see where our quarter inch bit, you know, uh, hogged away that waste material uh, based on that quarter inch end mill, it took about an hour and 31 minutes uh, to carve that with my quarter inch end mill, okay? Uh, and that quarter inch end mill, you know, all of the tool marks, I mean, it, there's just no detail in any of this. Uh, so that rest machining toolpath. Now that rest machining toolpath is going to be long. It's a six hour process. It's not a time saver. It's, you know, in many cases and everything, but it's going to come back and touch up these areas. And sometimes you have to determine if it's worth it or not. Um, if we preview the uh, selected toolpath, <clears throat> you know, it's going to come back and not give us too much more, too much better of a result there. Probably because I'm in a low quality viewing. Did I change bits? Hold on a second. Make sure that says 16th in there. Yeah. And so, you know, that right there did not do a whole lot for that. If I would have just came in and rest machining is kind of has its place and has it doesn't. But if I would have came in here and just created a finished toolpath on the selected vector, this time turn this off and just on this outside profile uh, with my 16th inch end mill and just calculated the toolpath for this model straight out. Jim, you can message me on Facebook Messenger, uh, uh, you know, spindle training videos, uh, the Facebook Messenger page, or you can text me at 352-404-3951, 352-404-3951. I typed it into the chat for you there, Jim. But... Um, 
even at that, let's say, you know, I'm doing this whole thing with a 16th of an inch end mill instead of, you know, trying to do the rest machining on it. Uh, let's take a look at what the quality will be with the same kind of preview settings I have. And also the time. Right now we were sitting at seven, uh, six and a half hours plus an hour and a half. Um, so eight hours was those two tool paths. Uh, and let's see what this one falls out as soon as it's finished calculating and we'll wrap it up. Hopefully we will close this out at uh, 8, 10 or 10, 10 in two minutes. Come on, you can do it, veteran. Give me that two minute mark. I appreciate you all hanging out with me tonight. And hopefully, like I said, you got maybe got some a, a bit of good information a little bit. Um, if you ever if you do ever get a chance to if you have Aspire and you're modeling and stuff and you're creating profiles and all check out the, uh, you know, using your uh, cross sections and things with different profiles, transitions and stuff. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, beadboard, you know, uh, that process for beadboard is pretty cool. Um, you know, for making like a faux B board panel. And um, uh, Shelly, Sherry Fuller, uh, I will text you. I've got some numbers for a B board panel uh, as far as uh, depths, cuts, and everything. I'll message you with those as soon as I find them. I, they're somewhere on my desk buried. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, the numbers I used were good, but if you don't want your beads to be, you know, that deep or that recess to be that deep, then the other numbers are pretty decent. All right, let's take a look at this real quick. Uh, it's finished uh, calculating with just no rest machining, just a straight um, <clears throat> tool path. And let's reset this preview back to a blank board. Let's look at our time. So this time right here, seven hours and 34 minutes. So no real time saving difference at all by doing the rest machining with the larger bit. And if we look at the quality of the cut right from the get with our 16th inch end mill. And of course you would have a rough cut in here too, guys, but you know, we've you know how to create a rough cut tool path, hopefully, because uh, I did it earlier, but I, it's just to save time. I couldn't do it now. Um, there was no need for it. But uh, so this is, uh, you know, a smaller, you know, design, but 16th inch um, ball nose end mill. Uh, my previous simulation quality turned low, but much better quality on there and only uh, 30 minutes difference from doing trying to do the rest machining procedure and stuff. Uh, so um, sometimes it has a place, sometimes it doesn't. And in this case, it didn't have a place. It, it, it was senseless to do it, I think. So, all right, guys and girls, thank you for joining me. Thank you for putting up with these uh, delays and issues and everything. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed that uh, lesson and um, – in making, you know, working with models like the compass, uh, the, you know, the star compass and, um, there's one right there. Uh, and, uh, and all until next time, I'll see you soon.